Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is Concepts Lecture 22, Theories of Photography. I'll talk first about uh, Roland Barthes' book Camera Lucida, and then an essay by the theorist Walter Benjamin, and then just a selection of other theories in which I picked out of dozens and dozens. Bart's book, Camera Lucida, is still the most widely read and assigned book on photography, even though it was written in 1980, 40 years ago, um, and there's been a tremendous amount of writing since then. Two ideas from this book have become especially influential. The first one is the punctum. That's the name that Bart invented for a detail in a photograph that suddenly strikes you or pierces you. He thinks it's like a pin. It can affect you. You can be affected by it. The punctum can be anything. Um, Bart describes this photograph and says that it's the seated woman's strapped pumps. Somehow they affect him very intensely and that's what's really of value to him in this photograph. And then a little later he says, no, it's the necklace. It's really the necklace that she's wearing. Whatever it is, he says, it should be something the photographer didn't notice because he wants to find something in photography that's not controlled by the photographer's habits, uh, by their education, by their hopes for what photography can be, and their and then professional requirements or technical requirements, all those things he finds very uninteresting. He's interested in the things that escape notice and in photography's capacity to always present things uh, that you don't think, that you weren't thinking about. By the nature of photography, those can, things can have to be, work their way, work their way into a photograph. In that sense, photograph is very different from painting because in painting, you might paint quickly over parts of the surface that you're not so interested in, but you are at that moment intentionally painting them in. Whereas in photography, you're bound to capture a number of things that you weren't thinking about and maybe that you never noticed even when you saw the photograph. The punctum is common in studio art classes and in art criticism. The problem is that Bart said the punctum is entirely personal. So even though he says at first that it was this woman's shoes and then that it was her necklace, um, he doesn't expect us to feel the same way. In fact, if we did, then what he had found wouldn't be a punctum. It would be something that, that we could all agree on and that would be part, become part of the conventional nature of photography, the parts that he's not interested in. So whatever a punctum is for you, it's not shared by anyone. Whatever it is for Bart, he can't share it with anyone. If you use the term punctum to describe something you see in a photograph, then technically you're misunderstanding Bart and you're using the term wrong. Because you can't actually create a consensus using the term. If you find something and try really hard to persuade other people, it's amazing. If you actually succeed, then it's not a punctum. Punctum should be yours and yours alone, and therefore it's actually not useful for discussions and conversations about individual photographs. Another influential idea is that photographs show us people who have died and they make us realize that we're looking into the eyes of people who have died. At the caption down there it says, he is looking at nothing. He retains within himself his love and his fear. That is the look. Bart is very fascinated by photographs of people, especially old photographs, because then the people will have died. And his book is full of pathos, full of uh, emotion, because he wrote it. He wrote it in the year after his mother died, and he had lived in the same house with his mother for decades. He was deep in mourning. He also wrote a journal at the same time, a journal of despair, really. So the, the book is, is very personal. Um, and at that moment of crisis, he decided to write about photography um, and especially about the things in photography that can really pierce you. So it's an affecting book and it's enabled a whole generation of art writers to speak more personally. There is an entire field called trauma theory, um, which uh, owes itself to some large degree to this one book. Bart's book also has serious problems. 
So this photograph is by the African-American photographer James Van Der Zee. Bart didn't notice or care about who the people were, about the conditions of the photograph. He didn't care about the politics or the place. Uh, the art historian Margaret Olin has shown that he didn't even bother to look closely enough to see that he misdescribed the necklace, the one detail that he supposedly cared the most about. So this book has all kinds of problems uh, that some people find really intolerable, and people have written about that in really interesting ways. But somehow, the passion of the book, especially when he's not writing about photographs like this, uh, has been very persuasive, and it continues to sell, and it continues to be assigned. Walter Benjamin was a German philosopher, essayist, and historian. He's one of the very few non-French theorists who are still important in visual art. And it's not a coincidence that he lived in the first half of the 20th century as opposed to the second half when nearly all the other theorists in these lectures lived. Because before the Second World War, there was a different configuration of culture and a different set of interest in visuality. And there are um, German and other scholars within Europe uh, whose work is still cited, but they're in the minority. He's one of them. He spent a lot of his time, years, in the Bibliothèque Nationale, which is the National Library in Paris, copying passages and assembling notes for an enormous book on the 19th century, uh, which is called The Arcades Project. He never finished it. It's published, this unfinished book. Um, if you look at it in the library, you'll see it's about a thousand pages long, depending on the different editions, translations, so on that you look at. It's full of text he copied from newspapers and books with commentary. It's been tremendously influential just as a book because it's not uh, a normal book of history. It's a kind of philosophy, kind of uh, almost a kind of a memoir, but it's also an encyclopedia. It's a very innovative and interesting project. He wasn't an especially visual person in general. Uh, the Arcades Project uh, might have been intended to include uh, photographs, but in the, in the version that he left, um, it doesn't have any. The art historian uh, T.J. Clark has criticized uh, Benjamin's account of the 19th and 20th centuries because Benjamin was unaware of the visual revolutions of modernism. Impressionism, of course, Manet, Seurat, the Eiffel Tower, the new Paris metro entrances, and things like that. But Walter Benjamin did write several texts on photography that remain very often uh, quoted and often assigned, especially in art schools this essay seems to be assigned all the time, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. If you're just starting out uh, and you haven't had in, in, in art school and you haven't had a, um, a course on photography or anything like that yet, then you probably haven't read this because it's not normally assigned in high schools. But if you were to go on, say, up through the MFA, you would, you would probably encounter this several times maybe even five or ten times in different seminars, it gets taught and retaught. It was written in 1933 and translated in English in 1969 in the collection called Illuminations. There's a modern edition of it there. It's usually used to introduce the idea that photography, unlike other media, can be reproduced. So there's no single original and no special value in any one print. Benjamin was despondent about this. He was despondent about the rise of mechanical reproduction and everything that it meant for society and middle-class life. Quote, even the most perfect reproduction of a work of art is lacking in one element, its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place it happens to be. Benjamin says in this essay that only an original of something has aura, a special quality that requires the presence of the original object. And photography by its nature, since it, since it can be infinitely and definitely reproduced, has, is a good example for him of something that's lost its aura. This is a, um, not just a theory of photography, it's also the way that Benjamin thought about mass reproduction in general, in capitalism, uh, but photography is the subject of this particular essay. When the essay is taught, the moral is usually that we need to be aware of how what Benjamin calls mechanical reproducibility in photography and film has changed our society, taking it away from aura and ritual, as he calls it, and bringing it into the domain of politics. 
But actually, Benjamin is a very conflicted person. He's very careful, he's an ambiguous writer, and he sees both sides of this theme. On the one hand, the loss of ore is painful, and there is a, quote, desire of contemporary masses to bring things closer spatially and humanly. But on the other hand, those same masses also want to overcome the, quote, uniqueness of every reality by accepting its reproduction. The unresolved conflict is the center of the essay, not just the nostalgia for lost present. So if, or maybe I should just say when, you're assigned to read this essay, you might uh, consider that as you read and uh, see how you think about how he handles that um, fundamental uh, conflict in modern life. So I just have a sampling of other theories because there, there are so many of them. Indexicality, so just to return for a second to the lecture before the last one, Charles Peirce's system of indexical signs. That theory was used by the art historian Rosalind Krauss to argue that photography is indexical. Unlike other media, photography and film are made by photons that physically strike the CCD. And this argument of hers, um, I say it lasted, I mean, like it was quoted and used from around 1985 to more or less 2005. You don't see it that much anymore, but it was influential at that time as a way of thinking about postmodern photography. There are several dozen theories of photography in contemporary practice, um, but the influence of Bart and Benjamin is still pervasive. I have some examples to close. Quantitative studies of photography have grown up um, since, um, since Roland Bart's book. Lev Manovich is a, is a visual studies scholar. Um, he has a project called Selfie City, which is an interactive website where you can study different qualities of selfies from around the world. So you can um, manipulate all of those um, parameters that you see up at the top. Um, you, can, you, can, you can organize selfies from different parts of the world depending on their expression, happy, calm, uh, how much tilt, how tilted the head is, that kind of thing. This is like an extreme version of Benjamin's Age of Reproducibility. There are no originals here and there's absolutely no aura and there it's completely replaced by statistics. When it comes to the aura, on the other hand, some writers are very interested in the earliest photographs. Uh, people study the very first photographs, but like this one by Nieps. It's one of the first photographs ever made. These can be very hard to see because they're small and they're often dark, um, but the originals exist and uh, you can visit them sometimes. You can see them in museums. So these are, uh, in a sense, counterexamples um, to uh, what Benjamin was thinking of when he was writing about photography, because these things are precious and unique. Um, and of course, they can be reproduced in a sense. I mean, here it is, but it's huge on a screen. It's not small on a glass plate or a metal plate. There's an aura of a very different kind in some photographs that have been widely produced, but, are, 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 but, but whose originals are very rare um, and that represent rarely photographed uh, events. Most famous of those, I think, are the three surviving photographs of the gas chambers in the Second World War. Only three photographs um, remained. You can see at the bottom, the title of the book about this is Images in Spite of All, because uh, people risked their lives to get these uh, three images out of the camps. Uh, the, the author, uh, the art historian, George D. Dumran, who wrote about these, has also written about uh, erratic, as he calls it, in other words, they have aura, erratic damaged paintings and photographs in other contexts. He himself uh, is very interested in um, originals that can't be reproduced in the sense that they belong to their context or, or that are so rare that they almost don't exist. So this is also in the spirit of Benjamin when he's on the side of the aura and against, um, and against uh, reproducibility. And of course, in this case, also engage uh, Bart's ideas about trauma and memory. Photographs also can elicit a kind of obsessive seeing that doesn't happen with other media. Um, and especially interesting in that regard are re-photographic projects. These are photographs, uh, these are projects where people go to a place where photographs had been made at some point in the past and set up a camera and take the exact same view. 
the idea of re-photographic projects um, is sometimes, as it is in this case, just to look at landscape change, environmental change, and other times it's for artistic purposes of other sorts. Um, this is a photograph um, taken in the 19th century of an obelisk that was put at the U.S.-Mexico border. There was a law at the end of the 19th century enacted that said um, the U.S.-Mexico border had to be marked by obelisks every 10 miles, and then they had to be photographed. It was actually in the law they had to be photographed. So there's a whole series of photographs of these numbered obelisks that used to mark the U.S.-Mexico border. And then um, somebody named Humphreys, a botanist, went back sometime around 1988, and he tried to find a bunch of them, and he photographed them from the same positions, the ones that he could find. Um, and his idea was just to look um, at vegetation change in the hundred years that had passed. So there is the one from the 19th century, and there is the re-photograph. Other re-photographic projects are uh, more obsessive. Mark Klett is a photographer and an artist who specializes in re-photographing pioneer photos of the American West. So he looks at 19th century photographs, and then he juxtaposes them with ones that he took from the 70s to the present. Um, and sometimes, like, um, a wilderness will be replaced by a parking lot, kind of obvious stuff. But in other cases, um, the effect can be really um, uncanny. This is a photograph by Timothy O'Sullivan. It's a 19th century photograph. He's one of the better known photographers of the American West. And this is a canyon in Utah. And there is Klett's re-photograph. He used the same camera and he went out to that spot um, in the desert on the same day of the year and at the same hour. So the sun was in exactly the same place. So there's a detail. That's Timothy O'Sullivan's photograph from 1880. And there's Mark Klett's photograph from 1979. When I first saw these, I thought there was no difference between them. And then I started noticing little tiny things, like there's a little pebble right there in the 1880 photograph that's rolled away in the 1979 photograph. So there's a kind of um, obsessive or a compulsive inventorying kind of seeing that happens in this kind of project that's very characteristic of photography. Um, and there have been interesting things written about the ways that people see photographs also the way they handle them, the way they collect them, and so on, that differ from the way that people treat other media. There were only a few theories of photography until sometime around 1970. A good essay on this is uh, by Sabina Kripal, which you could find in that book called Photography Theory. But by contrast, there have been at least 10 books on photography theory since 2010 which is more theories than anyone could possibly read. This is a field that's basically gone beyond the power of any specialist, any professor to become to be an expert in it because there's just too much in it now. And yet a lot of the guiding concepts of these new studies still depend on and descend from texts by Benjamin and Bart in particular, and Krauss and a couple of others. So uh, those concepts that I've touched on in this uh, talk come up over and over again. They are foundational even for some of the new studies.